Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are by visiting our websites, compassionatecooks.com or joyofveganbaking.com. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here doing the thing that I love most, which is talking to all of you. And I'm not just saying that as much as I hear from many of you who feel connected to an old friend when they listen to this podcast, I too feel very enveloped by all of you. It means a lot to me and I want you to know that. Jenny Feeney is the sponsor of today's episode, and it's been a pleasure receiving her very enthusiastic emails. Even before she became a sponsor, she wrote to tell me, how much she enjoys, or in her words, loves, in all caps, the podcast. She decided to sponsor the podcast when, well, I'll I'll tell it in her words. She said, I was driving with an acquaintance of mine, and he began talking about his girlfriend and her issues. He said, well, thankfully, she's not vegan anymore, because it was just too unhealthy for her. And I said, actually, there are tons of studies that prove that veganism is way healthier than eating meat. There's no cholesterol in a vegan diet, and beans and tofu are way healthier than eating animals, not to mention kinder. So then he says, well, I'm glad she's off it for now because I just can't afford her vegan diet. It's so expensive. To which I replied, actually, that's not true. First off, beans and tofu and those kinds of plant-based whole foods are way less expensive than meat. It's the processed vegetarian type stuff that costs more and it's not as good for you anyway. And in truth, the government subsidizes the cost of meat. So you're not even paying the true cost of the meat. You're paying part and the government pays part, which is insane since meat eating is so unhealthy and costs so many billions of dollars in healthcare costs. I went on to talk about a bunch of other stuff and I was just so excited because after 17 years as a vegetarian, I finally feel like I can defend my truth and explain it in clear and precise words, your words. It was just awesome and I just had to sponsor the podcast today. I can't tell you how much I love your podcast, how much I love the work you do. I was an English major before I became a veterinarian, and I think you speak with amazing eloquence and articulation and incredible intelligence. I appreciate that you have dedicated your life to such a great cause as this, the one closest to my heart. Thank you so much for everything you inspire me. Well, that's funny, Jenny, because you inspire me. All of you inspire me. Every single one of you inspire me every single day. I have said often, I don't know if I've said it on the podcast, that as an animal activist, I have learned many, many, many things about animals, but I have learned much more about humans. If I didn't see transformations taking place on a daily basis because of the emails I receive from you, I would have a very difficult time holding on to hope for humanity in general. And the animal rights movement in particular. So thank you, Jenny, for giving me one more reason to carry on. If you would like to help this podcast carry on, please consider becoming a sponsor. You can decide the level. You can contribute $5 a month or $10 a month or make a one-time contribution and everything comes with different benefits, different little gifts to thank you. You can visit CompassionateCooks.com and click on the button that says support our podcast. On behalf of the animals, I thank you. So I hear a lot from new vegans who have a lot of questions about the early days of their new lifestyle, and I want to address some of these questions today. Let me start off by reading a really lovely email from a podcast listener named Alexandra and then segue into her question, which is related to our topic. You can read Alexandra's entire story on the Joyful Vegan blog, which I encourage you all to to visit and certainly send me your stories. It's called the Joyful Vegan Stories of Transformation. You can access it through the Compassionate Cooks website by going under, I think it's writings and then clicking on the Joyful Vegan blog. Her story on that website is called From a Free-Range Egg-Eating Vegetarian to an Awakened Vegan. Here is some of what she wrote. I signed up as a sponsor of your wonderful podcast several weeks ago and have been meaning to reply to your thank you email ever since. What I wanted to say is that I should really be thanking you for the amazing work you're doing and that I'm so happy to be able to help out if only in a small way. I love the podcast. It literally changed my life, and I hope you will continue for a very 
long time to come. I have been vegetarian for about 10 years and have always been proud of my choice not to eat animals. Throughout that time, the notion of veganism was a niggling presence in the back of my mind, but I told myself that I couldn't do it for what I guess are the usual standard excuses. It's too hard. I couldn't live without cheese and yogurt. I wouldn't be able to go to restaurants anymore. Eggs and milk don't really kill the animals, yada, yada, yada. Listening to your podcast changed all that. Like the woman whose letter you read who made the connection that veal is a byproduct of the dairy industry that really clinched it for me. As a vegetarian, I had always felt that veal was one of the most reprehensible things you could eat. Yet there I was, supporting that very industry every time I put milk in my coffee. Honestly, I don't know why I never grasped the connection. After all, I grew up in a rural area and we actually had our own cow when I was a child. My parents would have the vet come around and artificially inseminate her, a process we knew she was none too fond of, because she would always try to hide when she heard the sound of his van coming down the driveway, which goes to show just how smart cows really are. The driveway was not visible from the paddock where Moo and other animals lived, yet she was able to make the connection between the sound of his engine and the nasty procedures that were done to her. Clearly, Moo was a lot better at making connections than I was, considering that I never made the link that she had to have babies in order to give milk. Nor, as an adult, did I consider the implications of what this would mean on a scale of mass production to have millions of cows constantly giving birth to calves that would be 50% male, and just what would happen to all those male calves. I suppose that's a symptom of being raised in a culture where everything is so disconnected, we become blind to what's going on right in front of us. And I suppose the truth is that, like most people, I didn't make those connections because I really didn't want to make them. Listening to your podcast is what finally cleared the cobwebs from my thinking. Looking around, I find myself seeing the world through new eyes. For example, I can't believe how many leather items I've thoughtlessly purchased over the years, or the fact that I never questioned what happened to the ducks whose feathers fill my duvet. What was I thinking? How is it that I could have given money to support such things while still believing that I loved animals? I think sending money to support the wonderful work you're doing is the least I can do to make up for some of my past purchases. So I guess I guess her I guess it's not really a question after all, but I I really am fascinated by how powerful the message of animal exploitation is in our culture and how that message is supported by so many people, so much that even those of us who were vegetarian first, who stopped eating land animals out of concern for them, were still unable to recognize the cruelty inherent in the egg and dairy industries. I mean, I read Diet for a New America, which was the first stepping stone to my awakening, but it was definitely just a stepping stone. I still continued to consume animal products. I was purchasing only cruelty-free products. I was contributing to anti-vivisection organizations. I would never think of wearing fur, but I was still eating fish. I was still eating eggs. I was still eating cow's milk. I was buying leather. Like Alexander, I too bought a goose down comforter. And it wasn't the fault of John Robbins' book. He addressed the dairy and egg industries in his book, but somehow I just didn't see it. I just wasn't willing to see it. Our ability to block out certain things that are not convenient for us is so powerful. And I'm just grateful that I persisted on my journey to know. I wanted to know. But it took me quite a few years before I read, ultimately, what did it for me was reading Slaughterhouse, which was the absolute turning point for me, the turning point that absolutely changed my life, absolutely changed my thinking, and changed my perception of of all of these things. After many years of doing this work and talking to people and hearing from people and and listening to people and watching people and observing people, I have to say that there really is a difference between being a vegetarian and being vegan. And please don't take that the wrong way. It's not a judgment. I have no right to judge anybody. It's merely an observation. Something different happens, something very profound. And those of us who were vegetarian for a while before becoming vegan know this. I think I've mentioned this before, but that process of becoming vegan is really that experience of becoming fully aware. It's the moment when the veil is completely lifted from your eyes and you become fully awake. It's it's why people like Alexandra and I were both capable of being vegetarian for many years before realizing that the same cruelty we opposed in the meat industry is also inherent in the leather industry, in the feather and down industry, and in all other animal use industries. Denial is a very, very powerful thing. And by the way, I will cover these industries in greater detail in subsequent episodes, so don't worry. I'm going to talk about the leather industry and the goose and uh, the down industry. 
So let's pause here for a moment and address a related question I received from people who newly vegetarian don't know what to do about like the leather couch they have or the leather shoes they have or the leather jacket, etc. Some people feel really guilty about having this stuff, but can't necessarily afford to just get rid of it all and replace it with non-animal textiles. I think they're also afraid of being judged, afraid that people who knew them in their old life, their pre-consciousness days, let's call them, are going to find them hypocritical for feeling so strongly about these issues now, but who still own animal skins. It might not even be someone else who makes us feel hypocritical, frankly. We might just feel that way ourselves as we experience the metamorphosis out of our cocoons. So I think the question to ask ourselves in this scenario is, how does keeping this couch, for instance, how does keeping this couch contribute to animal cruelty? Or flipped around, how does getting rid of it help animals? I think it's a helpful question to ask in this situation because as I've said before, for me, being vegan is a means to prevent suffering. It's not about being perfect. As it becomes difficult to have the couch in your home, then you can start the process of selling it and you can even donate the money to an animal organization. But it's not about being perfect, you know? It's a matter of doing the best we can once we do know. And I know I said this in another episode regarding non-vegetarians who wanna catch you if you're wearing leather shoes or something, that if you respond with something like, you know, I'm not trying to be perfect, I'm just doing the best I can, people get it. And I really think it gives them a new perspective about being vegan, a realistic perspective, because as long as people think that being vegan is about being some self-righteous saint, it's never gonna attract people. It's not exactly appealing. So that's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. But to dwell on the fact and feel bad for once having purchased these things isn't productive either. We need to forgive ourselves and move on. We need to find a way to reconcile that. I think the best way to reconcile that would be to try and be the best spokesperson for animals now, Um, being the best spokesperson for veganism by being joyful and truthful and humble and by living a life of integrity and respect for all beings. We can also make it up to past animals that we were responsible for hurting and, and killing by sending a ton of our energy and love to the animals we meet and know now. We can offer them a lot of love and we can love them really well. I don't know how to describe the overwhelming amount of adoration I have for my own cats. I adore them for the exquisite beings that they are, each endowed with unique characteristics born out of their particular species, born out of their personalities and out of their interactions with each other and the humans with whom they live. But I also feel sometimes that through them, I can channel my thoughts and my affection and my commitment to all the non-human animals of the world, that Simon and Schuster act vicariously, as it were, as ambassadors of all other non-human animals of this world. So I just put all of my energy and all of my uh, and all of my and love to them. And it's not a conscious thing. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how it physically manifests itself. And I've never tried to articulate this before. But if you can glean anything valuable from that, then fantastic. But we just we can't dwell on what on what we didn't do in the past. All we can do is focus on what we can do now. Um, Another really good question I get from new vegans is what to do with the meat and other animal products you have in your refrigerator or your freezer or your cupboard. As you know, we're talking about a consciousness shift here. And once you have that shift, it's not like you want to gobble up all the meat in your house to get rid of it. So a lot of people ask me what they should do with it. And again, this is just my opinion, take it or leave it. For me, it would be a no-brainer to give any unwanted animal products to my dogs or my neighbors or friends' dogs since I have no dogs. So if you have meat in your refrigerator or your freezer, you can feed it to your dogs or your cats, assuming, of course, that you feed meat to your companion animals. You can also donate meat to a local dog and cat shelter or to a wildlife center. When I talked to a really good friend of mine about this, she talked about how when she used to work at a wildlife rehab center, she used to get donations of meat from individual households all the time, like when it had a little freezer burn or something. 
and it was a huge benefit to the center. In my opinion, uh, that would have some semblance of justice rather than, say, donating the meat to a homeless shelter or a food bank, which would then serve to reinforce and even promote the continued consumption of animal products by humans. So that's why I wouldn't recommend giving it away to non-vegetarian friends or neighbors or people. It's just condoning the consumption of it. And you're giving away terribly unhealthy stuff to the people you care about. If the food can serve other animals rather than be wasted, that's the route I would go for sure. But if the food cannot go to serve other animals because it's spicy or in some other way harmful, then I wouldn't have a problem with just throwing it out. Again, that's my opinion. Do with it what you will. One complaint I've heard from people who have contemplated being vegan is that they'd have to read labels, heaven forbid. They think that their lives would be consumed by reading labels all the time. And all I can say is that it's not a good enough reason not to stop eating animals and their secretions. You know, I know some people are more comfortable taking the larger strides at first, like getting rid of the obvious things such as meat and animal milk and eggs and don't want to worry about the ingredients. Fine. It comes back to the don't do nothing because you can't do everything theory. But there are a couple things I want to say about this too. Okay, three things. Number one. Eat whole foods. The more you eat whole foods, the more you don't have to worry about the crap in your food because the animal products and the byproducts are, are only in packaged and canned and frozen and processed and fast and convenience foods and beverages. There are very few things that I even buy that aren't whole foods, but many people base their diets on this stuff all the time. You don't have to worry about hidden animal ingredients when you buy an apple or a bunch of kale. Actually, I take that back. With all the genetic engineering of our food, I can't make that statement definitively. So try to buy organic whole foods and try to buy the organic whole foods from your farmer's market and do stay involved with the very important issues surrounding the purity of our food supply. It's a very scary time in food politics right now. But um, but really, the best you can do is make whole foods the foundation of your diet. Number two, is once you know what to look for, when you become you know, a new vegan, once you know what to look for on the label, one quick glance at the label will tell you if it has something like gelatin in it. You just kind of know. You just learn t- t- what to look for and then that becomes your habit and it's not a big deal. It doesn't take much. And listen, if you have to weed through a number of ingredients, you probably shouldn't be eating that thing Anyway, personally, I would not want to put any commercial product in my mouth that has more than five ingredients. And I mean that. I'm not perfect, but, you know, I want to recognize exactly and I want to recognize exactly what those five ingredients are. You shouldn't feel like you're in a science class when you read a food label. And again, it's not the fault of veganism that processed foods are crap. We shouldn't really be consuming processed foods. I'd like at least not with the regularity with which we eat them today. So does that make sense? So let's just try to focus on whole foods. Number two is reading labels becomes a no-brainer after you know what to look for, but also try to purchase only things that have five ingredients or less. And number three, it's not a matter of trying to be perfect. I don't want to consume the blood meal or the bone meal or the boiled bones or fat deposits or whatever the heck they're putting in our food. I don't want to put that stuff in my mouth. None of that stuff is sold individually. We wouldn't buy it if it were. So it's shoved into our food, processed food, in ways that make it seem hidden so we don't actually think about it. Plus, they don't have to call it what it is because the manufacturers know we wouldn't buy it if we knew what it was. So let's talk about some of these ingredients. The history and controversies and politics surrounding the food label in the United States is a very long one. In short, do not get your nutrition information from health claims made on food packages, period. For a more in-depth account of the politics surrounding nutrition claims on labels, please check out Michelle Simon's book, Appetite for Profit, and Marion Nestle's book, Food Politics. I know I've recommended these books before, and I'm recommending them again. 
According to FDA guidelines, the uh, FDA regulates food labels. Products are required to list all ingredients constituting more than 0.1% by weight in order by amount, with the main ingredient listed first. The intention is to provide consumers with the information they need to choose the foods they want to eat, but don't forget that the manufacturer is also protected. In order to protect manufacturers from their competitors, not only do they not have to list the actual percentages of certain Certain ingredients, they can also get away with using generic, meaningless, and cryptic phrases such as natural flavors or, or natural flavorings. And natural flavors can be plant or animal derived, but they don't have to tell you. They don't have to tell the consumer the origin. Some animal products are obvious and some are hidden. Let's talk about a few obvious ones. Gelatin. Most people have heard of gelatin, and most people know what it is. But for those of you who don't, it is the boiled remains of bones and skin, connective tissues of animals, most often cattle, pigs, horses, and fish. Gelatin is the byproduct of the meat and leather industries. If it says gelatin on the label, it is animal-derived, period. Though there are vegetable-derived gelatins available, particularly in the form of agar or guar gum or carrageenan or pectin, they would not be the source if a label simply says gelatin. If it says gelatin, it's most definitely the boiled remains of animals. The products most associated with gelatin are jello, marshmallows, vitamin capsules, gummy bears, ice cream, and film, like photographic film. It's used during the development process. But gelatin is used in everything from glue, match heads, and even used to make playing cards and certain printing paper shiny and glossy. I can't tell you if this is the case with every brand of playing cards or matches, but I'm just telling you what I know. I had no, I really didn't know that. That was interesting to find out that there was gelatin on my playing cards. It's also worth noting that there are serious concerns about the relationship between gelatin and bovine spongiform encephalopathy. That's BSE, also known as mad cow disease. It's called mad cow disease in, in cattle, and it's human version, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD. So there's a relationship between gelatin and these diseases. And I remember reading a couple years ago that a vegetarian in Great Britain had died of CJD. He was a vegetarian who consumed gelatin, which is how they believe he was exposed through the gelatin. Um, some experts will say that the gelatin production process destroys most of the BSE prions, but I'm not convinced, and neither are many other experts. That's the whole problem with prions. They're virtually indestructible, and we've just begun to research these things. We don't really even know what we're dealing with, so I'm not taking any chances. Thank you very much. And if you're disgusted by the number of things that contain gelatin, you should be. Gelatin is a byproduct of the meat and leather industries. We kill 10 billion land animals and countless marine animals every year. 10 billion a year. So the industries have to come up with sundry ways to sell their byproducts. And these byproducts become very profitable they're very profitable industries, but they would not exist if we did not kill animals. Can you picture 10 billion? I can't picture 10 billion. 10 billion bodies mutilated, 10 billion decapitated heads, 10 billion animal skins, countless hooves, countless beaks, countless dismembered bodies every year, every year, just in the United States alone. It's surreal. The other animal ingredients you see on labels are whey and casein, whey, W-H-E-Y, and casein. I've talked about these things in greater detail in the All About Tofu podcast. Check it out to find out about the indisputable relationship between cancer and casein. Both casein and whey are derived from animal milk. When you curdle dairy-based milk to make cheese and such, you're essentially separating the, the milk solids, the, the curds, the casein, from the milk liquid, which is the whey. Again, if the label says casein or whey, they are most definitely animal-derived. And note that some soy and rice-based cheeses contain casein. Did I mention basing your diets on whole foods? Okay, good. So lactose is another animal-derived ingredient. And there's a real misunderstanding out there about the components that make up animal-derived milk. Lactose is the milk sugar that's in mammalian milk. And billions of billions of people around the world are lactose intolerant. Well, of course they're lactose intolerant because our bodies stop producing the enzyme we need to digest this sugar. This enzyme that our bodies make is called lactase. 
So human milk also contains lactose, by the way. We're mammals, right? So when we're supposed to be done drinking our own mother's milk, our bodies stop producing this enzyme because we don't need it anymore. Now, lactose intolerance won't kill you, but it can make you awfully uncomfortable giving you gas and bloating and cramps. And many people live with this without even knowing why or that they actually have the power to stop it. And with so many people suffering from this, the dairy industry came up with a brilliant solution, lactose-free milk, giving people a false sense of security. So they may be drinking lactose-free milk, But they're still getting the animal protein, the casein, which is a carcinogen. They're still getting the saturated fat, which contributes to heart disease and obesity, which contributes to diabetes. They're still getting the dietary cholesterol, which contributes to heart disease. There's nothing healthful about humans drinking the milk of another species. If you want lactose-free, casein-free, saturated fat-free, cholesterol-free milk, choose almond or soy or rice or oat or hazelnut or peanut or any plant-based milk you want. So lactose is something that you see on labels, which is animal derived. But keep in mind that if you see lactate or lactic acid, they're both plant derived. More accurately, they're bacteria derived, but they're not animal derived. So lactose is lactate or lactic acid is not. Lanolin is another common animal byproduct. Lanolin is a fat derived from sheep's wool. If you've ever had the opportunity to meet sheep and if they let you touch them, you'll notice that you're, you'll come away with this waxy, shiny residue on your hands. That is, for all intents and purposes, the lanolin. It's the byproduct of the wool industry and is most commonly found in cosmetics, lotions, moisturizers, lip balms. The product oil of Olay is derived from the word lanolin, which is a key ingredient. One good reason not to use it. The other good reason is that oil of Olay is owned by Procter & Gamble, a company notorious for its animal testing. And lanolin is always animal derived, always. If it says lanolin, it's animal derived. Stearate or stearic acid is a fat derived from plant or animal sources. So it's a little hard to tell. It's used for making candles and soaps and plastics and it's in some cosmetics. But again, it could be either plant or animal derived. Magnesium stearate is one type, and when it's used as a filling agent in the manufacturing of capsules and tablets such as vitamins, the source of this ingredient is typically cattle. However, there is an increasing number of vegetarian options in which the product specifically indicates that it contains magnesium stearate from vegetable sources. Since this ingredient is typically found in non-food items, this usually isn't a problem for me because the cosmetics and the skincare products I buy are all plant-based. But if you want to know for sure about a company whose products you buy, don't hesitate to contact them and ask them. They need to know the source of their of their ingredients. And if you want to know what it is, then you need to ask them as the consumer. The last ingredient I want to mention is carmine or cochineal, um, C-O-C-H-I-N-E-A-L, both of which refer to the ground up bodies of beetles. And it's then used as a coloring in, in processed foods. Now, Please keep in mind that processed foods are not only solid, they're also liquid. Beverages are also processed foods. The only beverage we need is water. That's it. But we're so inundated with all of this unnecessary crappy crap that's bottled and canned. And we think that even if it's like this healthy kind of healthy looking drink that it's necessary for us, we need water. That's all we need. Everything else beyond that is just, you know, is just a luxury. It's just, is just unnecessary. And I'm not saying you can't enjoy some apple juice or cranberry juice once in a while, but my point is we don't have a nutritional requirement for it. And we can certainly reduce some of the waste in this world caused by so many beverage containers by getting a good filter, buying some stainless steel reusable bottles and drinking the only beverage we really need, which is water. And by the way, just so that you know, I'm being consistent. The same goes for our consumption of non-dairy milks. They're wonderful and they're delicious and they're often fortified, but they're not necessary. They're 10,000 times better than animal-based milk, but in and of themselves, they're also just a beverage option. So I just think it's helpful to keep that in mind. So that got me off the whole corn, carmine point. The point I want to make about carmine or cochineal is that it's always animal derived and it's not even required by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, to be explicitly named in all ingredients list. It may also be called natural coloring or added coloring. Here's a 
bit of trivia for you. The Center for Science and the Public Interest, a very reputable public interest group, put forth a proposal that the FDA is currently evaluating that would require food manufacturers to list carmine by name because some people have severe allergic reactions to carmine and go into anaphylactic shock. So the food industries, of course, were vehemently opposed to putting insect derived on the label. And so they've agreed to use the word carmine. It's better than natural flavoring, but still most people have no idea that it's derived from crushed insects. Carmine is found in juice, dairy-based yogurt, and ice cream, and cosmetics. The word is derived from a word that means crimson. So essentially, you'll find it in products that are some shade of red or pink or purple. I think in another episode, I remember talking about the reaction um, my husband's coworker had when he found out the cranberry juice. I think it was one of the Ocean Spray cranberry juices that he was getting from the office vending machine contained carmine. He was appalled. He was just appalled and stopped drinking the stuff. But interestingly, he still continues to eat animals. But it's amazing what what things really um, stop us in our tracks. Here's a quick rundown of some other animal-derived ingredients you'll find on the labels of food and personal care products. Albumen, um, A-L-B-U-M-E-N, which is derived from egg whites. Isinglass, which is derived from the bladders of fish, specifically sturgeons, used as a clarifying agent in some wines. Uh, Pepsin, which is an enzyme derived from pig stomachs. And tallow, which is the rendered fat of cattle. Some ingredients that you'll see that are definitely plant-based are guar gum, which just acts as a thickening agent, and lecithin. You'll see it often on chocolate and chocolate bars and on chocolate chips, which just acts as an emulsifier. Uh, These days, we also see a lot of warnings on labels, things that say that the food was manufactured in plants and on equipment that have been used for cow's milk, etc. But this is more about liability protection than anything else. So please do not wind up driving yourself crazy by trying to be so perfect that you forget the whole point about being vegan. We have to walk this line all the time. It's an imperfect world. It just is. The rubber tires on my car have the remnants of animals in them. I kill insects every time I walk on the ground unintentionally. Apparently my deck of playing cards contain animal byproducts, but being vegan is about doing the best we can in this imperfect world. It's not about being perfect. If we lose sight of that, if we treat veganism as the end rather than the means, then we'll not only drive ourselves crazy, we'll also do a really poor job of attracting people to living a cruelty-free lifestyle insofar as we are able. But take heart in that. Though there are some things we have no control over, there are so many things we can do. I just think it makes more sense to focus on what we can do rather than on what we can't. And this leads me to the great honey issue, which creates great debates and splits in the animal rights movement, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. I'm amazed that people can be so judgmental of one another. Some people who call themselves vegan eat it, and some people who call themselves vegan don't. I don't care what people call themselves. I don't care what label they give themselves. There is no perfect vegan on this planet. And if anyone is striving to be just that, it's not a club I want to join. Here is my brief perspective on honey. I don't eat it. Why don't I eat it? I don't not eat it because it's not vegan. That would be too simplistic. That would perpetuate the notion that being vegan is about being perfect, that being vegan is an end in and of itself. And it's not for me. For me, being vegan is about not contributing to the suffering and exploitation of other beings, period. As humans, we act like every other being who was put on this planet was put here for our use. Bees did not get together and figure out that they had a really good commodity for humans to use. They didn't get together and figure out that they had this really great industry that they could grow so humans could become profitable from it. They make honey as a food source. They don't make it for us. And there are all these nuances and questions people keep asking about the bees and how they're treated and whether or not they're harmed in the process of honey production. The bottom line for me is that I don't eat honey because it wasn't made for me. I don't eat honey because it belongs to them. Does that make sense? And just with any of these animal products, if I mistakenly eat something that contains honey or something, I just move on. I just deal with it, move on. It's not a tragedy. It's just 
you know, it was just a mistake. I've had people write to me and ask me if they're still vegan, if they eat something with honey. Of course you're still vegan because your intention is to cause no harm. And all we can do is the best we can. Okay. I mean, even when we patronize a vegetarian or a vegan restaurant, we're not necessarily supporting vegans. What I mean is that there are plenty of vegetarian restaurants that are not owned by vegetarians. And it means we're putting our money in the pockets of people who are perpetuating animal suffering because they're not vegetarian. So does that mean I'm not going to support vegetarian restaurants? No. The point is that I just don't want us to kid ourselves into thinking that even when we go to vegetarian restaurants, we're adhering to some perfect vegan philosophy. Luckily, there are more and more vegan-owned and vegan-operated companies popping up all over the place. And when we're able, let's support them. I just want us to stop trying to be so perfect because I think that kind of attitude leads to self-righteousness and arrogance. And I don't think that does anybody any good. I don't think it does the animals any good. I don't think it does our relations with one another uh, any good. And so that's my whole intention is that we actually feel the joy in being vegan. We actually feel the abundance that comes with being vegan. I hate when I see on menus that they call veganism a dietary restriction because I see it quite the opposite. So I want that to be our attitude, that there's abundance out there, that there's so much we can do, that we have so much power, that we have so much empowerment, and to stop focusing on this idea that it's about, you know, stamping ourselves with some certification that says 100% pure or something. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine, but that's just not what I advocate. We humans can get a little too wrapped up in ourselves. We can get a little too wrapped up and get a little off course you know, we're not perfect. And I think if we can start from there, realizing that we are not perfect beings, but we really have the potential to be remarkable beings, I think we'll make great strides in our own individual lives and for the bigger picture. My hope is that as humans, we can navigate through this world with the grace and integrity of those who need our protection. My hope is that we could have the sense of humor and the liveliness of the goats, the maternal protective nature of the hens, and the sassiness of the roosters. May we have the gentleness and the strength of the cattle, the wisdom and the humility and the serenity of the donkeys. May we appreciate the need for community as do the sheep and choose our companions as carefully as do the rabbits. May we have the faithfulness and commitment to family of the geese, the adaptability and the affability of the ducks. May we have the intelligence, the loyalty, and the affection of the pigs. And may we have the inquisitiveness, the sensitivity, and the playfulness of the turkeys. My hope is that we can learn from the animals what we need to become better people. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. 